Welcome to our peer-to-peer -peer podcast. Um, today we're going to be talking about the commons and patterns of commoning. Uh, we've got some peers with us today. Uh, we have Silke Helfrich, David Bollier, and Nicholas Perrin. Uh, so to begin, I thought that we would uh, each take a moment to introduce ourselves in true peer fashion. And uh, so I'll, I'll start. Uh, my name is Tammy Lee Meyer. I live in what's known as Vancouver. Uh, and in, in the unceded Coast Salish territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh people. I sit on the board of directors for a small credit union called CCEC, and uh, that stands for Community Congress for Economic Change. And I am an affiliate with Sensorica, which is an open value network that has a fab lab in Montreal and help and produces open source hardware. Uh, I sit on the working group as a member for the working group for indigenous food sovereignty. And I also live in a community home where over the last 10 years, I've lived with over 300 people. And uh, so, Silka, I would invite you to introduce yourself. Yeah, first of all, thanks for the invitation. My name is Silke Helfrich. I'm from East Germany, that is, I, I, I grew up very close to what has been the system border between East and West Germany. And then I guess I became a kind of cosmopolitan. I've been working in Latin America for um, a few years. And when I came back in 2007, I started to work as freelance on the Commons, co-founder and co-founder of um, a loosely connected group of Commons activists, David among them, called Commons Strategies Group. And in Germany as well, uh, I co-founded the Commons Institute. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Silke. David? Uh, I'm uh, David Bollier. I live in Western Massachusetts, and I'm an activist, scholar, blogger, book author uh, with a primary focus on the commons. I spent many years in Washington, D.C. as a public interest activist with Ralph Nader and later with the TV producer, activist Norman Lear. Uh, I've been working on the commons for 15 or 20 years, increasingly with international uh, activists and scholars, uh, including Silke Helfrich and Michelle Bowens of the Peer to Peer Foundation. And uh, essentially, we try to advance the commons paradigm in a variety of ways, culturally, politically, economically, and through activism. Wonderful. Thank you. Nicholas. Yeah, hi. <clears throat> My name is Nicholas Perrin. Nice to see you all. Um, I am, I guess, from Kansas in the States, but also currently here in Vancouver in the unceded Coast Salish territories. And I think probably most relevant to this conversation is um, uh, my participation in the Metacurrency Project, which is a group of people, currency designers and coders and kind of cultural hackers that are, um, I guess, in support of Scepter which is a recomposable medium for distributed social computing. It's kind of a, a blockchain-like uh, code architecture that we'll be launching in 2017 that we think is a kind of um, grammar uh, for constructing pattern languages around commenting. And so I'm super excited for uh, the research you all are bringing together. Wonderful. So I thought we might start with language, which is a critical commons and something that we all share. Some of us uh, have more languages than others, um, but it is important for us to really understand what is the commons and what is commoning. So I would invite uh, either David or Silke to, uh, to share that. Well, I can, I can start because David already mentioned that he looks at commons as a paradigm, right? But in fact, if you look at the commons literature, you will find very different perspectives, kind of different entry points to defining the commons. There is one, when, one very common approach, which is, I would call it a resource focused approach. That is basically defining the commons as collective resources 
which are owned collectively and shared and stewarded um, uh, collectively. So this is a kind of resource focused approach where it matters very much if you look at if you share water or if you share knowledge. Mm -hmm. A second entry point would be for me, and this comes closer to my understanding of the commons, is focusing on social relationships and on the social process that enables and enacts commons, so to say. This is something we call commoning and commoning as social process is determining in, in the commons discourse and framework. And perhaps, and this connects back to what David just said, um, a third level would be looking at the commons as, as an attitude, as a worldview, as a concrete expression specific in each context of an ongoing paradigm shift. And I would just add to all this that part of the challenge in building the commons is escaping a lot of archaic language that we don't even know is archaic because it is an artifact of the 20th century industrial era of thinking that, for example, the idea of thinking of commons just as a resource is a very conventional economic perspective as opposed to one language that realizes this is about dynamic social relationships that are changing that have to be negotiated and coordinated which is a different plane of discussion, which our language needs to reflect. So part of the challenge that I struggle with myself is escaping the limitations of, of existing language and to develop new ways, new logic, new vocabularies to adequately express what commoning is all about. Well, you basically, you cannot describe the commons with the word of uh, a market-based economy. You need to come up with new concepts, which are kind of focused on how to deepen social relationships, how to really assess the social process, how to assess complex social systems. And you cannot rely on mechanistic ontologies uh, when doing so. I, I think by shifting from the emphasis on the commons to commoning, you've actually you know, really successfully placed this sort of at the center of the storm, so to speak. It's not necessarily a, sort of a, a nostalgia or a reaction to enclosure, but there is a way I think that you're moving more towards the um, knowledge economy um, sort of ontology in the way that um, speaking and sharing, there's, there's a different way I think in which you're speaking about commenting than the commons and the resource uh, management. And I wonder if you might not spell that out a little bit more for us. Well, um, Is that if, you look at, if you look at common taxonomy, so or common categorizations, let's say, in the commons literature, you will very often find categories like the digital commons, the material commons, the traditional commons, etc. Mm -hmm. And this is a categorization based on this resource-focused thinking. For instance, people say, and economists say, this is basically neoclassical economy, that you have resources that, get more, that get, become more when we share them, and you have resources that become less when we share them, and we should treat them differently, which is correct. But this doesn't make up yet for a categorization as if a water commons would be different at its heart, at its core from a knowledge commons. I believe that it isn't. I believe that every commons has a material basis. Every commons, being it in a digital world or a knowledge commons or producing Wikipedia, at the very end of the day needs to use material resources from, from the planet, energy, for instance, the food to feed the people who, who produce knowledge, for instance. Mm -hmm. So each commons has a material basis. At the same time, each commons is a knowledge commons because it doesn't, it's not important whether you manage, steward, and share water or knowledge. You need to know, first of all, how to do it. You need to know how a commoning works. 
-hmm. And most importantly, each commons is a social commons because this social process of commoning is at the heart of whatever commons you can think about. Yeah. The other thing I would add, add to that is we're so accustomed to thinking in terms of individuals that uh, we, that becomes the category of analysis when in fact the collective is often the more relevant uh, category of analysis. Mm -hmm. I th we see this happening, in, I think, in a, in a lot of different academic fields, such as evolutionary science, where they're now starting to talk about natural selection occurring at collective levels, group, group levels, as opposed to by an individual organism. And I think in the digital world, a lot of Silicon Valley is focused on designing software for individuals uh, presumably individual consumers, mm -hmm. but in fact, social networking, the whole ontology is about the collective and the dynamics of a collective and how they interact as a group as opposed to thousands or millions of individuals. So these are the kinds of uh, ontological issues that are not just interesting philosophical side stories, but I think at the heart of what needs to be addressed. And I, I wonder in that, just very quickly as a follow-up, if moving, I guess the implications of my question were more, if we don't have to have some sort of knowledge commons where we're developing a practice around shared co-patterning in order to actually begin to govern resources as a commons in and of themselves. And so if, the, there, if these two things aren't... Um, coterminous uh, I mean I guess they're I'm saying that they are but if that's fair to say um, that the two scales are dependent upon one another more so than we just have to have resources if I'm, I'm just wondering why we haven't already had these commons if that isn't the case uh, well Nicholas I'm not sure I really understand your question because it's a kind of um, it's a bad connection over here over the ocean but um, if I got it correctly, um, if you look at uh, the title of our last book, David and I do a kind of, well, we do three volumes um, uh, laying out the, the diversity of the commons, commons practices and commons, commons approaches um, today. But if you look at the title of our last book, which is the second uh, out of three, it's called Patterns of Commoning. Mm -hmm. And this is precisely, it, it builds on the pattern theory um, from Christopher Alexander, who, who, and it tries to make us understand that it is important to have a look at the resources in the middle of a commons. It is also important to have a look at the institutions we need, the legal frameworks we need, the organizational forms we need to kind of host uh, the commons, but it is even more important to look at what happens actually within these institutions. And you're very right in saying that we would need a kind of patterns approach that is coming up with solution that works for the same problem that come up over and over again in the comments. Who is in, who is out, who will be excluded, who not? How are decisions being taken? On what, based on which kind of principles? How do we deal with um, um, free riders, how to resolve conflicts, who is entitled to resolve conflict in a common, etc. And you are very right that what you are missing right now is kind of not developing recipes nor panaceas because there is no such thing as a panacea in the commons. Each commons is, is one of a kind. But coming up with those patterns that can inspire us to apply them in our context bring them down to earth, root them in our context, and still help us knowing how to common. That is, look at the practical side of how to do it. And I'm very convinced that if you come up with such a powerful pattern language, we can enable a lot of projects which are already on the way, trying to build their commoning process, but constantly being threatened, co-opted, or corrupted, are not being able to deal with inner conflict. To, to, to try to respond to Nicholas's question in a different way, while of course it makes a lot of sense to talk about the resources, 
historically that's embedded in, has been embedded in the standard economic approach, which has been resource and object focused, which has put the social dimensions, not to mention the intersubjective personal psychological dimensions, totally in the background as, as side stories, as peripheral, as not really consequential. And the whole point of talking about it in an integrated way, especially as patterns of commoning, is to bring those soci social and psychological and even spiritual and meaning-making dimensions into the foreground. Uh, and the, the, the resource is part of that, but it's not the dominant uh, aspect of it. So it's kind of a, a shift of perspective without losing sight of some of the, of the characteristics of resources. One of the pieces that I really appreciate that you're really putting your fingers on with the commons is there's a, there's, we're, we're in an economic framework that is, an, is a framework of exclusion. And so when we talk about the commons, we, I think that it's important for us to know that this is what, uh, these, are, these are things that we already, that we should share. Uh, and that many communities of practice are finding ways to do it but these uh, patterns of commoning are ways that we can actually model how it is that we're doing the workarounds. I would point to Sensorica as one example of an open value network in, in what they're doing with creating open source hardware. And there's quite a few workarounds that they have to do in, as, as incorporated bodies because a network can't be incorporated. A network can't get insurance. Uh, who has responsibility uh, for, uh, for if someone has an accident at the physical lab in Montreal. And so what they've done is they've created a network of, of, uh, um, of pieces that interact together. So there's a custodian that is a nonprofit that's incorporated um, that is the custodian of, of the assets of the network. And, and then there are people that come into the network with their standalone projects and participate as sovereign units within the system. And so it's a hack, um, but it points to the fact that our systems are designed for non-human entities, incorporated, incorporated bodies that are persons under the law that have migrated a lot of the power that should, that need, a lot of the power that exists today into non-human entities that are not there to serve the commons. So I think it's important to put our finger on that uh, because what we're doing is we're, we're really looking to breathe life into the commons through doing it and modeling it for each other. Um, so I guess I'm interested in, in is some of the, one of the things that I love about your work is both of you is that you've had created anthologies, many, many stories of people, uh, communities of practice and people who have been doing the actions of commoning, patterns of commoning themselves. And I think that it is a way to model the distributed network of people that are already doing this and help to shed light in real and concrete ways. So I'd invite you to share um, some of those people um, that are modeling the patterns of, of commoning in a way that's really inspiring for you guys. Well, it's, it's an overwhelming task because there's just dozens and dozens of such examples. We tried to sort of highlight some of them because they range from indigenous people in Peru managing the biodiversity of potatoes to time banked in Helsinki to the people who created a Libra office as an alternative uh, software program. And it just, it's, it's this diversity. And I think part of the issue is that we do not have a shared imaginary and language for describing these highly disparate and dispersed phenomena. But in fact, they're an ancient form of social organization that in the context of our market industrialized culture need to be rediscovered, reasserted, made culturally visible again. So I think that's part of our challenge is to make it, make common and culturally visible as a credible alternative way of meeting needs that doesn't necessarily involve the market 
certificate of the state, at least directly. I absolutely agree, uh, and it's not only about making the commons culturally visible, it's also about raising awareness that in each of us there is a commoner. I'm always surprised that when I give talks in Germany and I start using these examples, at the end of, at the end of a talk people approach me and they say, oh, but I was thinking about it, that's basically what we are doing at home, or that's basically what we are doing in our neighborhood, or that's basically what we were talking about when we started a uh, refugee project or whatever. So what I would like to see is um, kind to um, unlock this tacit knowledge, this kind of um, still covered under a veil understanding that there is a common in each of us and all commons, they may look very differently, might be in Chile, Japan or Canada, but all commons have some, something in common. And if we can show this, we can actually show that we are the 99%. Absolutely. Nicholas. I think that there is um, even another level that your ontological shift is inferring and in that our bodies already operate as the commons, that there's a certain ecological process that is already there that rather than us try and figure out how to do better than, we just need to know how to steward. And so there's a, there's a shift, I think, in our relationship to how we moor our own knowledge within a kind of natural processes of nature, which is really... I'm being redundant there, but really well, important. You, you prompt me to discuss a, a, a friend and teacher of mine, Andreas Weber. The, he's a theoretical biologist and eco-philosopher whose book, Biology of Wonder, basically takes us to this new place by reinterpreting evolutionary biology and saying that our, embody, our bodies are part of nature. Nature is not an other that's separate from us. And while this is often said rhetorically, he takes it to a very deep empirical level to show how human beings are embedded in nature. And partly, I think we're rediscovering that and learning the implications of that, uh, especially in contrast to the enlightenment. He proposes that we move from enlightenment to enlivenment, so that aliveness and presence is really at the core of the commons and lived experience. So your, your comment is very on point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And not redundant at all, I would say. Actually, I would add to it that um, if the commons, this links back to my former um, um, contribution, to my last contribution, if the commons would not be an embodied experience, people could not pay consciousness about that they are, in fact, already partly, at least part-time, when they are not doing their jobs for the market capitalism, uh, commoners. Um, and the same way, um, what, what, what I experience very often, for instance, I want to try to unravel those hidden core ideas that all the different comments share. And one of them, to my understanding, is the decoupling of giving and taking, mm -hmm. which is very different from the equivalence exchange on the market. Commodity, where you exchange a certain amount of money to a certain amount of commodities, and they are supposed to have the same value, right? So in the comments, you have this decoupling from giving and taking. You don't suppose that there is a certain value that it is exchangeable reciprocally um, with each other. So when, for instance, I speak theoretically about this principle um, of decoupling, giving and taking, people try to say, but it doesn't work. The world is like this. We are not like this. And then you go, for instance, to a farm where they do community supported agriculture. And you see how people actually, what they actually do is they share the risk of production. And they cannot know how big at the end of um, the harvest their share will actually be. If they get five kilos of tomatoes or only three kilos of tomatoes because it has been a bad harvest that year, too much rain or whatever. Because they basically don't rely on that idea of equivalence exchange here is your money and give me the commodity, but they just 
share the risk of production, and then they go to the farm and take their fair share. And this feels very different. Look at yourself. If you would do this, going to a farm and take your fair share without calculating, can I afford one kilo? Can I afford two kilo? As opposed to you go to the supermarket, look at the price tags and start calculating, calculating, calculating. So what the commons, commoning basically does with you, it kind of makes the calculating self a little bit smaller in you and makes the commoning self a little bit bigger in you. Mm. Yeah, I'd like to contribute just some thought around indigeneity as well. In, um, I feel like there's almost a remembrance uh, that is happening because indigenous peoples all over the world have been commoning since time out of mind. And I feel like there's some, there's some deep value in helping to link those movements and uh and help and looking to see where those movements can help each other because here in canada which has been colonized and has uh you know a lot of healing to do our last residential schools closed in the 80s uh, and so there's been some uh really profound um uh violence that's happened and that our indigenous peoples here in Canada are still recovering from. And they hold sovereign so rights of sovereignty within Canada. And those, those uh, practices of sovereignty are still coming back as, the, as they're healing from what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission terms as cultural genocide. So while that might be a little heavy, um, it's important for us to really look at, I think, the practices of commoning that have been with us for thousands of years and see what kind of linkages that we can make together. Um, I, th I think there's enormous opportunities for mutual learning and north-south solidarity through commoning because I think indigenous people have a lot to um, share and to educate us with about uh, to the extent that their cultures have remained intact and kept those traditions alive about what's possible as a feasible way of life. What he was talking about or kind of implying has to do with um, a deep correction of anthropology coming out of the Western um, academic tradition. And it's as if in indigenous practices, we could, anything other than the market was just primitive, that there was no contour to those systems. Um, and that talking about commoning is giving us a way to, um, yeah, provide some specificity, I think, um, and detail to the cultural practices and social practices before, before European colonialism in these cultures, for sure. Well, let me, let me answer perhaps with an anecdote. I've been at the World Social Forum in, in Senegal, Senegal, Dakar, um, I don't know, five or six years ago. And we were giving a talk about commons and commoning and uh, a lot of people from Europe have been in the room, also from the European Parliament. And their reaction was basically, basically but, but, it cannot work, but, but. It didn't fit with our institutional framework. It was a constant but and a big but, right? And at the end of the session, somebody in the last, in the last row stood up, it was a, a black man. He stood up and he said, it is, I guess he was from Ghana, and he said, it is the first time that I've been hearing somebody talking about the concept that basically describes what we are already doing. Hmm. This was a big um, gift for me because it's precisely why I'm so in, in love with the comments because it's deeply rooted cross-culturally in human history yes. and it's very it's a very empirical approach you could not talk about commoning if those practices weren't there so it's basically my, making sense and connecting very different practices which remain rooted in their culture it's not patronizing and colonizing as an approach and it's absolutely true it allows us for a different um level playing field in the North-South dialogue as well. Yes. 
I, I wonder with saying that while we're trying to get David back, since Tammy opened up this conversation about language, if so, could I couldn't get you to reflect um, maybe on law and language and this kind of gap in between social practice and legality and how it is that um, tactically we might address that as commoners because it seems that there's a lot of problems there. I, will, I would actually I would like to um, David to speak about this issue because among us he is the expert on law and the commons. Okay. Uh, a thing I can certainly contribute and it, it relates back to that language question um, which by the way I have to deal with on very different levels because I think that we need to speak about the commons in our own language so I'm always struggling with translations from German to English, English to German, French to German, Spanish to German, and vice versa, let alone the indigenous languages, right? So, but there is one kind of, again, conceptual note we need to, to open before even discussing the words. For instance, if you speak about, you were just speaking about sovereignty from indigenous people, yes. mm -hmm. I think that we need to reinvent new words. Because if you speak about sovereignty to people with a market state and nation state framework, they will understand the sovereignty of our people, that is the citizens of the US or of Canada. Right. Or the sovereignty within a framework of representative democracy. Mm -hmm. Speaking about this kind of sovereignty based on a different concept of the human being is something very different from understanding sovereignty where the subject is the I related with the other, where your unfolding as human being goes through and only works through the unfolding of the others as well, where you are a kind of nested I instead of an isolated I. So for me, it's always, I'm always struggling with this, that we come up with concepts like law without questioning the premises these legal concepts are based upon. If we have a legal framework based on the idea that um, private property, individual property is a holy cow, we have a, we have a problem, we have certainly a problem. So it's not so much about, um, um, twisting the law here and there, adding a paragraph or, or changing an amendment or whatever. It's about questioning the pillars, the mental framework, the mental infrastructures our legal framework is based upon. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate um, that piece because in, in part, we need to create new, we need to look at the conditions that have informed where we are now, and we need to create new conditions for commoning. So, you know, one of the things that I'm really looking to explore, and I'm so grateful that you're, you're here, we're here today exploring it, is what is, uh, you know, how can we share our work and share information and model what commoning is through a communications practice. So the peer-to-peer -peer podcast uh, would be, a practice of commoning uh, so that we can begin to kind of really uncover some of those some of those questions that we have some of the conditions that exist and see where our commonalities uh, are and and in an effort to look in the same direction and to look at what those underlying structures are that we need to shift well, perhaps let me finish there um, with an optimistic view, because what we're just doing is connecting with each other in a way that hasn't been even possible, thinkable, only 20 years ago. So there are new conditions in the world we live in with all the problems of new enclosures as well. Uh, but the new conditions we can build upon are, first of all, um, the market state is in crisis. The state cannot draw any more on the resources based on that um, market-driven economy because if it does so at the very end, it will end up in extractivism, both of nat natural resources and of mental resources and social resources. This is the first thing. 
the energy basis will change. Uh, we basically um, are testimon testimonials of the end of the fossil fuel era, era. Whatever comes next, it won't be the spill of petrol anymore we have experienced uh, during the last 40, 50 years. Uh, what also changes most importantly is the way we can communicate with each other and connect with each other. For the first time it is possible to build networks at a global scale on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. That is, reducing the control of an intermediary and self-govern the way um, we engage in communication. And if you take into account that communication, connection, sharing ideas, code and knowledge makes up a lion's share in, in value production, well, you can basically understand what this means. It challenges the model um, uh, uh, things are produced today. And the last element I'd like to contribute is that I think that there's also a mental shift in the young generation, at least in some parts of the Western Hemisphere, where the idea of autonomy and a good life, quality of life, and sovereignty about your time, over your time, seems more important to some of the younger generation uh, people than, I don't know, have a job for the rest of your life and earn enough money. Welcome back, David. Uh, and thank you, thank you everyone for being patient with the technology. It's fantastic to have it, and sometimes there's glitches, so thanks for rejoining us. <clears throat> Nicholas. Yeah. Reflecting on what um, Silka just said, I had, I had asked a bit of a question about Commons Law before, and David, it seems that you might be the person to answer it, but I think I'll reframe it in light of, of what Silka just put forward. Um, we were sort of talking about indigenous social practices and um, a, a kind of healing or an anthropological corrective to the way that uh, market culture hasn't been able to actually give contour to the kind of practices of the commons and just seen it as primitivism and stuff like that from before. And so I sort of laid out these two levels of like social practice and law uh, of things that we have to concern about with our commons. And I was going to ask you if you couldn't talk about the the differences between the two a bit, but I also might add now, because we're talking about communication technology, if we aren't um, at a moment where there is this kind of third thing now, uh, and this is coming from my own pr practice and things I'm interested in, but with code. Um, and I know uh, not blockchain per se, but something like that where we can begin to build something more agile in between social practices and law. Um, yeah. Well, I this is a really important topic because I think conventional law, at least in Western industrial modern societies, uh, is seen as this quasi-autonomous thing that is disconnected and not intimately connected with social practice and um, what's going on among ordinary people. It's something that legislatures and courts and legal uh, lawyers and legal scholars deal with and the rest of us only have the most minimal participatory relationship in it. I think what's happening is that com the commons and commoning are starting to assert a different type of socially dynamic law. I call it vernacular law, meaning it's based on ordinary and formal and tacit practices, but it is every bit as formative, if not binding on people. It's just not written down in law or administered by uh, formal courts and things like that. Uh, and I think we're seeing this uh, greater legitimacy and moral authority and effectiveness through vernacular law, especially in online context, where you certainly see it in the indigenous context, uh, whereas this husk of Western law that is formalistic and presumes to be utterly coherent, comprehensible, and logical is falling apart. It doesn't have moral authority. It can't, from a centralized role, administer this vast dynamic changing in complexity of decentralized phenomena. And so I think seeing um, part of the, the struggle is, as you said earlier, um, Tammy, about developing hat legal hacks 
either organizationally or legally, for which comedy can somehow carve out a safe space for itself within a philosophically hostile body of Western law. But ultimately, I think it's about developing our own forms of law that have their own integrity and um, organic character. And that's where software code comes in, where I think that we can have this uh, accessible middle level that Im embeds our social preferences and relationships within an infrastructure, an infrastructure that enables those relationships um, and is more dynamic and changing than, say, the U.S. Congress or the Supreme Court. Uh, and I think that, so I think there is this larger, not yet recognized struggle between vernacular law and conventional Western law that is playing out in any number of different arenas. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so where do we go next? Um, there's obviously... Silke. Silke says to bed. Because ah! <laughs> it's definitely later in Germany. Yep. I might want to land on some of the conditions um, that, that we need to really bring the commons alive, it really enliven the commons. And so I'd love to hear from each of you uh, some of the thoughts that you have around yeah, how do we how do we do it? What are the critical paths, and what are what are the what are what do we need to build? You start with your passions and your talents, and the sphere of relationships and influence and local situation that you have. I mean, I think there's so many levels of answer to that question in the sense that you start with your with what you can do, but Ultimately, we need to build these middle and higher level infrastructures of law, of finance, of physical and uh, social infrastructure to make comedy work more readily instead of it just being a huge struggle with each one. But I think that means we have to honor that impulse within each of us, nurture it and develop it within a, a collective context. I mean, that's kind of a meta answer to your question, but you know, it's gonna vary from one location to another, from one individual to another. I, I would say, and this is what our work um, tries to contribute to very consciously is trying to make the comments a meme, like of this DNA um, of culture that goes from mouse to mouse and brain to brain and will sediment there so that people can start wondering what what are they talking about what do they mean by this as I was starting a huge 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 social conversation political open conversation creating a bus so to say and and then trying to connect the dots and make sense of this uh, conversation strengthening the comms because we need to start wondering what the comments is all about think about the comments make sense of it because if we cannot do this we cannot construct them neither that's sort of what makes this i think an open-ended mystery and adventure and human necessity mm -hmm. and i think it's what drives me along because there is something very deep that needs to be recovered here and I think that each of us has an important role to play in that. And it is about developing this collective awareness, the connections among us, the new models, the new policies, and so on. And um, I think we're at just the very early stages of this cultural, political, legal, financial transformation. I have a little hack that might help us along. Um, it's called E prime. Uh, you remove the verb to be from your speaking patterns. Uh, so I guess in German it would be sein. And in doing this, uh, just to use an example, even within, say, a fight with your significant other, um, you're not allowed to say you are. So you're removing is to be more. And you aren't assigning static ontologies to anything. Actually, everything is spoken subjectively or in relationship to its process 
and it doesn't hit these psychological notes, neurons in the brain that make people defensive, it actually allows you to talk about things as a process. And it's a practice, um, if you listen to me, I haven't mastered yet, but <laughs> I'm going to work on it. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you, you might remember that the text in our last book, or I just called, um, the comments doesn't exist, or the comments don't fall from the sky, or whatever. Actually, what I want to say there is, that the comments is a constant process of becoming. Mm -hmm. So we cannot use an essentialism, essentialist philosophy. We need a kind of process philosophy to really assess what we are talking about. So I'm, I, I very much appreciate this little hack to uh, stop talking about exist or sign or to be. And mm -hmm. always framing a sentence like, I become a commoner. Because that's a constant, it's a way of becoming, a way of becoming a different person, whereas the seed of this different person is already part of my inner being. Yes. Mm -hmm. In some you. ways, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Tammy. I was just saying thank you. No. In some ways, I think this is about how we escape from the alleged uh, market individualism that we're all imprisoned with in some ways, at least as a public sensibility, and to more publicly, collectively recognize these relational aspects of ourself, which are there, but are often not recognized. You know, I'm recently finished reading Sebastian Younger's book about war veterans and how they have post-traumatic stress syndrome not necessarily because of what they experienced, but because of what they come back to, in which often the society is not a collectively coherent social society. Uh, and so people ignore what they experience and they can't get reintegrated. And I think this is at the root of a lot of our problems, that we see ourselves totally as disconnected units and not as uh, intrinsically connected to each other. And this is something we're struggling to name, identify, and make more, more real than it has been. Absolutely. And so the, the offering and the idea of the peer-to-peer -peer podcast is, I think, a way for us to be able to model what connection is, what we bring to the table, help us to articulate um, what it is that we're working on to different people. Because if this was a, if we had one person who was either missing or joining, uh, we would have a very different conversation uh, because everyone brings such different things to the table and you have the opportunity to really go deeper and to understand. Uh, so I would put, I would put the, these kinds of conversations, these peer to peer conversations as one of those practices that I think can not only help us to express ourselves and articulate what we mean by the commons and by the work that we do, but also more deeply understand how other people frame it so we can get a sense of the tapestry that is between us. Uh, and so I want to put that forward and invite Tell me if I may. Tell me if I may. I very much like the metaphor of a tapestry between us. Uh, whereas I don't like the idea of a model or modeling the comments because I precisely think we should delete this kind of language um, of our vocabulary because modeling is a kind of a mechanistic framework where you think of like you could repeat the thing over and over again, but it will be different in a different social context, in a different historical context. So. We, we can come up with patterns that need to be adapted and appropriated to that specific context, but certainly not with models or panaceas. And yes, we are weaving together co-creatively a tapestry, a different social web of life, so to say. That, that's a compelling uh, metaphor for what we are doing. Beautiful. So I would invite us to uh, wrap it up. I notice where I know that everyone's got busy things going on and I notice that we're coming up for our hour. Um, so I would invite uh, everyone to share 
any, the ways that you could be helped, what would be useful for you, as well as any links to your work that you might want our viewers to see. Well, I find it a great source of support simply to have these kind of conversations that connect with other, uh, other active creative commenters. I mean, I sort of try to keep track of my work on my blog, bolier.org, so I invite anybody to check that out. The work of the Common Strategies Group can be found at the website commonsstrategies.org. Um, but that's, those are two starting places that I would cite, but Silka has more, I'm sure, to add. Well, I have those crazy ideas in mind, right? Like, I think that we need a huge conference or happening or fiesta about arts and the commons. We need to draw the creativity of the so-called creative class, the designers, the artists, etc., towards the commons. I'm, I always feel like I, my heart hurts when I see designers selling their services for making more advertisement on the market, which is something we definitely don't need um, as human beings, but uh, other, other people need it for other purposes. Uh, so this is one thing I would like to see to happen, a huge happening uh, among designers arts, artists, and to comments. And a second thing I'm always, always worried about is like David and I, in all our books and all our work and writings, we try to connect the digital, the modern, with the traditional, the material, the water, land, and forest-related uh, commons. But in essence, I think that the hackers are the natural allies of the farmers who do uh, community watched agriculture, for instance. So I would like to see those worlds more connected, supporting each other, where the ones kind of enable and construct the networks and infrastructures um, the others need, uh, and vice versa. The others free those who prefer working on bits and bytes. So I think that if we could build that alliance among all sorts and all types and all tribes of commoners, that would be tremendously helpful. Until now, everybody's kind of working within their own networks, speaking their own language. Pretty hard to understand, for instance, the, the, the kind of language digital commoners speak for people who work on the land. Mm -hmm. And the last thing um, I would see to happen is, I would like uh, to happen is just, um, doing more creative work on describing the comments in plain language. Sometimes also, and this is a kind of self-critical reflection, we're trying to be too, trying to be, um, too um, sophisticated perhaps. Sometimes we need to learn how to convey those ideas which are complex certainly, but convey them in plain language so that everybody can understand. Speak with more metaphors, tell more stories, share stories about commenting that touches people's hearts and minds and, and helps them starting a new coming process. Yes, absolutely. I think allow the meaning that you want your work to have to be explicit in it. Um, at one point, this is deeply theoretical stuff we're talking about, but there's also a kind of cutting away of the tactical uh, and the realness and immediacy in what you're talking about as well that I, I really appreciate. It's a different approach to how to practice theory. And in that way, I would encourage people to read this book, Patterns of Commoning. There is uh, a lot of different uh, intuitions uh, of mine that I saw coming together from different angles in it. And so I uh just want to thank you for the way you've been able to tie all these things together it's uh i haven't really found it in other spots um and uh i would add to that uh yeah keep your ear to the ground for news about scepter and the source tree commons uh, as this year closes off and in 2017 because i think that's going to be a tool that a lot of commoners are really excited about Hey, we are preparing for the next book, Nicolas. That might be interesting for us, indeed. Great. <laughs>
<laughs> Wonderful. Excellent. And uh, I would just like to thank you all for your time today and invite you to really consider others who you might want to have these kind of generative conversations with where we can explore each other's work, find out how we can help each other and help to progress our work together. So thank you so much for your time and your presence and your work. Thank you. Until next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>